गुड मॉर्निंग एंड गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर जॉइनिंग अस टुडे फॉर साइंस गैलरी बेंगलुरूज एग्जीबिशन सीजन कंटेजन वी आर ऑन द लास्ट वीकेंड ऑफ द फर्स्ट फेज ऑफ कंटेजन एंड वी आर वेरी हैप्पी एंड एक्साइट टू हैव विद अस टुडे और डिस्टिंगश पैनल ऑफ एक्सपर्ट्स टू स्पीक टू ह्यूमन राइट्स एंड नॉलेज ड्यूरिंग क्राइसिस बिफोर आई इंट्रोड्यूस आर थ्री एक्सपर्ट्स टुडे आई लाइक टू ऑल्सो मैंशन द प्रोग्राम्स फॉर दिस वीकेंड uh we have a public lecture today evening at 6:30 pm by uh the a curator from the Smithsonian and biological anthropologist Sabrina Scholz her talk is titled working together for public education on pandemic risks the scientific collaboration of the Smithsonian's outbreak exhibit uh we also have tomorrow a excellent masterclass by WHO technical officer Avichal Mahajan who will be speaking about listening with ears an AI assisted tool that let us understand what people are thinking and talking about during the pandemic and do not also miss a guided tour of dr jenner's house uh, the early history of vaccination by the jenner museum which is on sunday 13 june at 5 pm ist now to introduce to you our uh, the experts on our panel today who will all be talking about global health i'd like to start with say abunbola Sai is a health systems researcher and a global health scholar. He has worked as a health system practitioner in Nigeria where he completed his medical training at Obafemi Awolu University Ilefe in Australia where he completed an MPhil in public health and a PhD in health systems research at the University of Sydney. And then he was in the United Kingdom where he was a Sydney Sachs Overseas Early Career Fellow at the University of Oxford. Sai studies community engagement in governance, decentralized governance, and the role of governance in the adoption and scaling up of health system innovations. He is currently the Prince Claus Chair in Development and Equity at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands, a senior lecturer at of Global Health at the University of Sydney in Australia, and the editor in chief of BMJ Global Health. Our next uh, speaker is Sharifa Sekalala. She is an associate professor of global health law at the University of Warwick. She is an interdisciplinary researcher whose work is at the intersection of international law, public policy and global health. She is particularly focused on the role of human rights frameworks in addressing global health inequalities. Her work has been published in leading legal international relations and public health journals. Sharifa is currently leading a welcome funded project on the migration of digital health data in sub-saharan Africa. And finally I would like to introduce an academic advisor to the contagion season as well as uh, the person who will be moderating today's discussion Sanjay Bhattacharya. Sanjay is the director of the history department Center for Global Health Histories, a professor in the history of medicine, a welcome plus senior investigator. and the head of the WHO collaborating center for global health histories based at the university of york sanjay specializes among many things in the health medical environmental political and social history of 19th and 20th century south asia as well as the history and contemporary workings of international and global health programs around the world sanjay is deeply involved in the world health organization's global health histories project whose global activities are coordinated from inside the WHO's regional office for Europe. I would uh, before I hand over to Sanjay to begin this extremely interesting session, I'd like to remind the audience that they can share their questions in the Q&A box. We will have a live Q&A session at the end of the discussion. I'd also like to encourage everyone to please fill out the feedback form. We'd love to get your feedback on the session and to always find out what we can do better going forward. Now I'd like to hand over to Sanjoy Sai and Sharifa to start today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madhushree. So uh, first of all, uh, Sai and Sharifa, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, I know both of you are very very busy with a variety of things, so we're truly very grateful for your time. but i can't think of anyone better on this planet to tell us and teach us about human rights than the two of you so that's why the invitation came and the first question i want to throw at both of you is why do human rights matter because you know we've got a vaccine now and we've got science and we've got technology we should just you know 
celebrate that endlessly, thank the people who brought it to us and not worry about anything else. So why worry about humans? They should just gratefully accept the vaccine. So in this COVID era, in your opinion, why should we advocate for human rights? Say it. I was hoping Sheriff would go first, given that she's a human rights <laughs> scholar. But, but I, 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 I'll take a quick stab and I'll hand over to, to Sheriff to, to, to yeah. go deep. Um, I, I think the fundamental issue here is that technologies are socially constructed um, and, and they don't solve social problems by themselves. And we live in a world of uh, quite profound inequalities and inequities that, that the existence of a vaccine um, in itself will not guarantee its equitable distribution or access to, to everyone. And I think that that's a reason why we, we can't not think about human rights and the rights of people to be treated and, and valued equally. And in a world in which um, there's rich and poor at individual and national level, um, we, we can't just uh, ignore the, the fact that these inequalities exist and they determine um, who, who gets what. So I'll stop there and hand over to Sharifa, who, who I'm sure has a lot more interesting things to say. Anyway, that's, that's a fantastic question. And I think it's one that I was grappling with at the beginning of the crisis. Because at the beginning of the crisis, we were told, of course, that this crisis was going to be this great equalizer where everybody was in it together. But as we have seen in the past 18 months, this is just not true. And what I have been struck with is not only kind of just thinking about the crisis to getting a vaccine, but the inequities that we're going to be left with as a result. And as a lawyer, it really struck me the ways in which governments used immense power at the beginning of the crisis in order to give us laws that were deeply unequal, further perpetuated inequities, and we have no conception of when they will end because it is a crisis where we do not really have, as a historian, Sandro, you know a lot about this in terms of when do pandemics end and we're never quite clear when the end is. And I think for me that is of concern because governments have given themselves power around civil and political liberties, around whether we can protest, around whether we can scrutinize their actions, around whether or not we can seek judicial review. And this is kind of pretty much universal. So it's not just some governments, it's pretty much kind of a universal exercise. The second thing is that although we kind of know very much that this has huge, um, that this crisis showed us huge inequities, governments have done nothing about economic, social and cultural rights. What we have done, again, is transferred huge sums of money to huge corporations through follow schemes, through giving them a lot of uh, rights around how they can treat their employees, and done nothing for ordinary people. And I find that really shocking that in periods of crisis, we have then used laws in order to not deal with kind of human rights aspects that people want around better housing, better accommodation, better health outcomes, but instead transferred even more power to people and groups who are already powerful. And I think that that is a real concern. And then around vaccines themselves, we have seen vaccines being hugely inequitable. So inequitable in terms of the global North and global South, where lots of countries in the global South are not considered human enough because they do not have any rights to this access and instead, what we are left with is charitable models. So the G7 says, we'll give 100 million vaccines. But that is not a right. So tomorrow, you could get a sense where they decide, well, we will give 50 million. So what happens next? And I think a framing in rights, which makes it integral to humans to demand that, is really important in order to create equity in terms of vaccines. But even at the national level, my sense is that we haven't really thought about inequities in terms of access. In order to really think about the ways in which at the national level, we have seen inequalities, so inequalities 
uh, on the grounds of race, on the grounds of um, age, on the grounds of economic status, and really tried to use those programs to build back better. So we just treat again the vaccine as a scientific exercise. We think, well, um, all people, um, all people suffer more and therefore we will give them the vaccine. And in countries that are hugely inequitable, you have some old people who have had very minimal impact and they're getting the vaccine ahead of some younger people with huge inequalities, people with precarious jobs who are struggling to get days off in order to get vaccinated. And so we see that not using a human rights approach just perpetuates both national and global inequalities on a wide ranging scale. I mean, I mean, this is fantastic because what you two have done in very few minutes is to deconstruct a very heroic narrative that seems to be swirling around us in relation to how everyone should be grateful for these many schemes, these many emergency schemes that governments have come up with uh, at a uh, pandemic uh, at the time of a pandemic crisis and and of course uh, the fact that you know there is some state uh, support to ensure that there is no mass in, uh, unemployment is important but at the same time what Sharifa you pointed out uh, to me and it really makes an impact uh, on me is, is, is this idea that it's also disempowering the people uh, who are on such support so this is something I think we all should remember that uh, 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 good is a complex uh, concept, which I think especially the young who are listening in uh, should remember and always uh, push against. Uh, if I can push both Sharifa and say, uh, you refer to the term global and uh, uh, I assume here that you're talking about a very large global infrastructure, you're talking about UN organizations, but also non-state global actors, uh, many of whom are actually mobilizing funds that they give, give out as charity, uh, they call themselves charities, uh, from corporate profits. Uh, so, do you see a difference between high income country uh, sort of national messaging, such heroic messaging uh, and, and charitable actors pushing back? Do you see these global charities who claim to say they're here to help the world have a more nuanced understanding of human rights? Or do you actually think they're all on, on the same side, which is why impertinent people like the three of us need to uh, keep pushing for human rights to be considered in agendas. So I, I think that that's a fantastic question, Sandro. And in some ways, I think it, it also depends on what our, our conception of human rights is. So Bakshi, who's um, a really good uh, legal philosopher talks about kind of imagined trade related understandings of human rights. And we seem to have gotten to that point where we understand human rights in quite a specific way. And I think that that is problematic because human rights were always meant to be universal. They were always meant to be tools of global activism. And there's really kind of a huge and rich history of them doing exactly that or people from the global south struggling against colonialism, or people from the global south struggling for recognition or of the fact that they're human. And I think we have lost a bit of that in the discourse. And that is partly because of this charity model where we are getting people who might mean very well speaking on behalf of those people in the global south about what exactly their struggles should be. And that I think is deeply problematic because what it does it reproduces certain norms. It doesn't question some of the underlying rationales around the systems, the global systems that we have, both within the institutions that kind of say, well, we believe in a right to essential medicines without critiquing some of the underlying questions around, could we ever have essential medicines with an intellectual property regime that looks exactly like this? 
or people who say, oh, we believe in the right for everybody to have health when what they are pushing is digital tools that are made by Google and Microsoft in order to create universal health. And so I think that when we ask for what rights are, we need to really think about those peoples on whom we are asking for rights and really take it out of a charitable model where we have people with huge amounts of power again, speaking on behalf of people that they have frankly never met, frankly never asked meant to them. And I think that these are kind of deeply problematic assumptions when you think about the ways in which we change our health outcomes. Thank you, Sharifa Say. I, I like where Sh Sharifa sort of ended it, which is about, um, knowledge, which is people they've never met, people they've never asked about what, what it is they really want. And it, it's something that I think about a lot, um, that, that how do we make big assumptions about what people want? Um, and how does power play into that? There was a point you mentioned in, in, in your question, um, uh, Sanjo, about these things are complex, even good, the idea of good is complex. And, and when you have a complex reality, a complex social system, one of the things that is true about them is that you, you can't, any knowledge of them is partial and provisional, right? You, you can't claim a, a complete knowledge of something that's complex. And in fact, because of complexity, you have to defer to the knowledge of those who are within it for the most part. And one of the things I find in, in how we think in, in global spaces is, um, this thinning out or flattening out of complexity, um, this assumption that, that you, you can know these things and you can speak on behalf of. Uh, and when you do that, often you, you speak from a position of power, you, you, you focus on what you can see and what makes sense to you. And, and when big philanthropists talk, of course, what makes sense to them is, is money and, and intellectual property rights and, and the ability to trade and, and the ability to make income, and then the ability to use some of that to save other people's lives. So, so there, there, there's a very interesting perspective that, that, that you see from there. But when you look from the other side of the divide, you see a completely different set of perspectives. And for me, a big challenge in global health is how, how do we switch those poles, right? How do we move from a place where we privilege certain perspectives to the ones where we privilege the other set of perspectives? And what does a system that allow us to do that look like? Right? It's something I think about a lot. No, I mean, this is fantastic because this then brings me to the second set of issues I want to learn from you two about. So, you know, the idea of someone being vulnerable. So how does that appear? I mean, I mean is it an imposed definition? Uh, again, you know, considering all the issues, very important issues you've raised, or, you, or is it something that is a fact in the sense that, you know, or, or should we be thinking in terms of levels of vulnerability where some are less vulnerable and some are very vulnerable, simply uh, to highlight, I think, what you two have already very powerfully taught me, that there are national inequalities as well. And then basically the global unequal systems make those inequalities worse rather than reducing national inequalities. So, so, so for you, what is the concept of the vulnerable? So, I think, um, so in some ways, the concept of the vulnerable, again, we have to go to the people who are experiencing vulnerability because it will very much, um, it will very much change from person to person. And one of the things that in some ways, I guess is perplexing is that somebody might be vulnerable, but might not, not even have any conception of their vulnerability, or maybe they are struggling so much in terms of real life struggles that an, an idea of vulnerability is just so far from kind of their, their very experience. And there is something in the naming there around vulnerability that I think uh, is important. So what I've um, been thinking about much more recently is in some ways is thinking about these inequalities uh, and also kind of 
the concept of vulnerability, both at the national and the international scale, but also trying to kind of think around ideas of how different intersectionalities might make people more vulnerable. And this is going to change very much from societies that are racialized to societies that are not racialized, where you might have other ideas of vulnerability that might come in. So ethnicity might be a huge thing that makes you vulnerable. Gender might make you more vulnerable. Socioeconomic inequalities might make you more vulnerable. But I think what's important for me as a human rights lawyer is that in some ways we already have the framework of thinking about all those vulnerabilities as human rights violations. And I think that that can then be very powerful for using that framework in order to not flatten, but in order to kind of heighten individual vulnerabilities and think about how the multiplication of those really makes, uh, really, uh, makes people, uh, how we can help people who are vulnerable in those multiple ways in order to kind of get some semblance of their rights back. And I think that that's for me the important thing to think about. And I think in there, we then must ask again of the human rights framework, some questions around the ways in which it, for instance, uses additive models around just kind of thinking, oh, if we add this and this, that makes somebody much more vulnerable. Well, it might be just much more complex Mm -hmm. And I think courts in the global south have been really helpful at thinking about those structural inequalities and intersectionalities in the ways in which uh, they help to respond to some of these claims. And I think human rights can learn a lot. So we've had a recent court judgment from South Africa where they try to use intersectionality with women who had no land rights in order to give them back not just kind of land, but some semblance of saying, it is just more than land that you need. There are all these multiple inequalities because you're a black, you're a woman, you are socially uh, and economically deprived, your land was taken away. And so the response cannot just be, we give you just your land back. It must be something deeper and more structural than that. And I think we have a lot to learn from jurisprudence in the global South and kind of not really think that human rights in Geneva are kind of the gold standard because there's lots of interesting things that are happening. So are you then saying, Sharifa, that we lack contextualization in global health policy? Absolutely. So I think that we lack contextualization. And also I think we are lazy because we want things, <laughs> we want kind of an additive structure that is not complex. So we want to say, if you add this and this and this, then somebody becomes that, and therefore you can give them these health outcomes in this way. But actually, we need to ask deeper questions about where that person lives, uh, what, whether they're in precarious employment, and those are complex. And I can understand that in order to perpetuate the field, we think we'll deal with the easy questions. How many vaccines can we give people? But I think that we need to set ourselves deeper and kind of more strenuous challenges. Uh, and that is kind of being really critical about kind of the entire ecosystem in which people live. Wonderful, thank you. Say? Yeah, what, what, what struck me as, as Sherifa was talking was, is, is this idea that, that people are not just one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a person who is vulnerable on X issue does not necessarily have to be vulnerable on Y issue. Um, and, and I'm interested in how um, the, the framing of vulnerability itself yeah. can limit our ability to see a person in, in their fullness. Um, and I, I've been, in a lot of the work that I've done as, as a health systems researcher, one of the things that struck me is how resourceful people can be in spite of vulnerabilities. And, and very often when we want to solve people's problem, we, we come to them um, assuming a way, th their agency in that way, that, okay, this is a bunch of vulnerable people, we're gonna come and save them. Uh, and in many instances, people are doing very interesting things to, to solve their own problems. Uh, an example is what Sharifa talked about, sort of taking things to court, for example, uh, having representation, having the agency to make arguments on, on, on their own cases. Uh, and I think it, 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 it cuts across a lot of global health um, domains, that, that there is a way that the narrative of 
of global health events or health events or equity related events are, are, are structured that, that limit our ability to see people um, fully. And it's something that, that Sanjo, you think about a lot. Uh, is, is how, how we tell the history, for example, of, of smallpox eradication or polio eradication, uh, and the ways in which the narrative is constructed to paint heroes and, and people who were saved. Whereas the, the, the more you open those, those box of saves, you realize that they were the heroes themselves in, in many, many ways yeah. and at many, many levels. And I'm just really interested in how we use language and framing in a way to, to take away some of that fr from, from people. Um, the, the other point that I wanted to make is, um, it, it's also the idea that when we talk about vulnerability, um, again, a question of narrative, that we often don't talk about it immediately um, reflecting on why people were vulnerable in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, that that vulnerable, people are not just vulnerable. Vulnerability is just, it just doesn't draw from these guys. You know, there, there, there are reasons behind them. Um, and and I, I wish we had more capacity um, in, in our heads to, 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 to hold those two things at the same time. That you are vulnerable. I'm concerned about that, but I also recognize that here are the things that made you vulnerable, and I'm concerned about that too, right? Um, I, I, and for me, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in juggling those two things at the same time. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. So, you know, I mean, one thing I have to say and I have to be aware of is the fact that you, Sharifa, me, we all work for leading uh, high-income country universities. So that, I suppose, makes us seem less vulnerable, uh, mentally vulnerable, more mentally capable to some of these global funders who don't look like us. So I think race plays a part. And, and I, you know, I mean, I'm very grateful to the Bengaluru, Bengaluru Science Gallery for allowing a, a sort of, you know, a panel of, 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 of one Asian and uh, two Africans to speak and raise these very difficult issues. So uh, the, the question uh, uh, oh, I want to ask Sandra seems to have we just wait for him to get back online in a second for a second. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing that you said, say, about kind of vulnerability and not thinking about um, what caused it, but also in some cases about the results fully. And so I think that um, I've, for a long time, I've been concerned that Western scholarship is really obsessed with definition. We want to define things. And that definition makes us feel safe because then it's an absolute definition and it doesn't matter whether it's complex. But what that does is that then it in some ways prevents us from kind of thinking about what came before it or what came after it. Because when you are thinking about the narrative, that's kind of in some ways quite messy. So if you're going to kind of go back and go forward, it, it doesn't write well. It challenges the person who's reading it in order to kind of think about uh, some of these ideas in ways in which they might not if you've just divined things and then gone on to kind of find solutions. And there is something there that I think is deeply important about the ways in which we have all been taught to write <laughs> that kind of obscures so much. Yeah, yeah. And, and sort of just that, that obsession with definition, what it also does is that it, um, a definition reflects the perspective of one person or group of persons, right? So, so once you hold an idea fixed in that way, you, you limit you limit the multiplicity of ways you might approach it. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Sanjay, you're welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is the pitfall of, of, of technology, you know, supposedly infallible technology. Uh, so again, I just wanted to I was trying to say when when the system collapsed that uh, that um, you know I mean we are we have advantages as uh, three uh, people of color but we work in leading high income country universities that makes us more acceptable I think to some global actors than others 
So we are privileged that way. We are less vulnerable. We are still vulnerable because, you know, uh, we're still not equal in the room. I mean, sometimes we're in the room just because they want to present us in the room. Uh, how do we empower then those who are less fortunate than us and make sure that their perspectives, their ideas, their life experiences can flood into uh, organizations and agencies, non-state, state, international, global, uh, uh, so that they are better informed of the context where they have to go adapt their work and actually make a difference. Is that the way to make human rights more visible uh, in, in, in around the world during this terrible pandemic? Sharifa? Yeah, so absolutely, Sanjoy. So I think that human rights must be fronted by humans. And one for me of the greatest sad, the thing that I find really sad is the way in which human rights have become an abstraction. They, the, they, they're kind of just this disembodied voices. And in some cases, kind of the same voices again and again, kind of becoming champions of these rights. And I think that we need kind of just that greater diversity in, <laughs> in a less kind of diverse way. So I think that diversity means, it, it, it's another thing that's quite complex that I think has been uh, really devalued by the ways in which uh, diversity has become performative. And I think that really involves um, really challenging the way in which we kind of, we write with others, the ways in which we attribute knowledge so that people who gave you this information are authors. It's not that you're just translating, but really kind of giving them authorship. It's the ways in which we construct our projects in order to ensure that we are constructing them and giving kind of due attention and also challenging funders a bit around the fact that these are integral people in scholarship and not just people from whom we extract data. And I think that those things are really vitally important. Of course, as you point out, there are limitations to that approach. You might not be very successful, but I think that that is the right thing to do. And if we are taking human rights seriously, then we really must think about kind of the humans behind them. And of course, those struggles will also permeate at the national level because it might be that the person that you choose to collaborate with is kind of the superstar in Uganda. And it's finding the people who are less of superstars and kind of really the authors of those rights. So another quote that I like by Bakshi is that human rights are authored in the suffering of people. And I think it's thinking about those people who are suffering and thinking about ways in which we can represent them and really kind of hold true kind of their uh, experiences when we are talking about kind of these rights violations. Say? I will speak briefly to my experience as a journal editor, um, because I think um, journals play a big role in, in this spaces of contestation, as spaces of contestation. And one of the things that, that I have been concerned with trying to redress is having a, a global health space um, in, in, that, that is heavily um, predominated by people in high income countries. Uh, and one of the things that happened there, again, going back to an earlier point I make is that you, you start to see things from just one perspective, from one very, very, very limited perspective. Uh, and for me, the challenge has been, how, how do we have a, a, a space which is a, a global journal space? Um, that, that, that takes on board the, the multiplicity of views that are present in the world um, and have people, especially from LMICs, um, represent their views about issues, which would often, uh, as I've discovered, as many others have discovered, will not necessarily align with what happens in the global north. And, and in many ways, you know, um, when you bring people into a space or when you expand a space, everybody feels slightly more uncomfortable Right, it's it's um, it's is the nature of spaces, but but, but I think that that is where uh, progress and enlightenment, uh, sort of interpreted broadly, comes from, is where we all sort of brush ideas off of each other, 
and when you have a very uh, homogeneous um, sort of ideas, which, which is often um, the status quo in, in a lot of the spaces where we, we operate, you just feel a, a certain, it's almost anemic, sorry, I'm using a medical word, it's, it's pale. Um, uh, uh, um, and so I, I think the, the, the challenge is, is how, how do you bring in more voices into those spaces that disrupt them and, and paint a more complex picture of, of the world and of rights and, and of, of what works for people in, in different places. No, I mean, you two raise tremendously important points. And this then brings me very nicely to another question I have. I want to learn from both of you, from your answers, is it seems to me that often when people, uh, global actors want to say, okay, we're in a pan pandemic situation, we want to make differences, we are aware of diversity and differences and uh, and uh, we want to be culturally informed and, and do the right thing. But then I sense overgeneralization and sometimes a fetishization of the traditional. So what can we do as academics to bring in those other voices that you both have told us are very important to bring in, but without allowing the small groups of global actors fetishization, fet fetishizing tradition because uh, the, the simplification of tradition, what is traditional, what are traditional beliefs and bringing them on the table can weaken the democratization of human rights as well from, so, so what do you think? Have you encountered this as well? Because I certainly have encountered, you know, I mean, uh, I'm told that yes, there is cultural difference, but then that new cultural definition is homogeneous as well. So what has been your experience? Um, so yes, yeah, so Sandra, I think that that's uh, a really interesting question. And I think that we, we see that quite a lot. And my sense actually is that it's not even that we are going to look for lots of traditional voices. My experience in my research has been that we are just looking at the same actors. So my first study in which I looked at human rights in the Global Fund uh, went to kind of examine how the Global Fund had engaged with human rights on the ground. And one of the things that I found in that study was that people had very quickly caught on to some of these buzzwords and what made, what made you a desirable person to go to Geneva. And so in some ways that was also performative. Uh, that experience was also performative because everybody was playing the same game. So the people in the Global Fund were thinking, we want to find these people who are kind of key in tradition. The people on the ground were thinking, well, we can't be ourselves because this is what these people want. And so you get a very strange level of double multiplicity and nothing really that is going to really engender human rights in the ways in which you want them to be. And I think that that is deeply, uh, deeply problematic. And I think it becomes also problematic because there's a way in which the people on the ground have also learned that this fetishization leads to nowhere because at the end of the day, what is going to matter is um, the indicators that the Global Fund is going to use that don't have any narrative, that are going to abstract models of human rights numerically in order to come up with some sort of score, uh, is going to think about the apps that are going to be introduced in order to help with sexual reproductive rights, and so it's all performative because I don't think that anybody seriously thinks about this because they have learned over time that these organizations are going to do exactly what they're going to do. And none of this is going to make a difference. And so this serves absolutely nobody when we treat rights in this way, because we know that rights themselves are diverse, but, under, uh, but underneath them, we kind of really have to think about uh, what it means for everybody to have some sort of inherent rights that do not then disadvantage others because you have your rights. Thank you, Sharifa. Say it. 
there's a, I think it's on this, it's in our audience, there's a, there's a PhD student that I've been doing some work with, um, is Dr. Kenneth Yakubo, um, who has been studying the, um, the, the utility of the rights framing in, in arguments or discussions around health worker migration. And he did quite a big um, literature review, um, trying to look for, for how that framing has manifested in, in different spaces. Um, and one of the most interesting findings from, from that um, study, which is going through review now, is that for the most part, people were not necessarily using the, the global sort of WHO, UN framing of rights necessarily, but they were evoking rights the way they understood it, right? Um, within countries, whether it's nurses union or, or you know, all sorts of spaces. And it, people used a conception of rights that made sense to them. And that was what worked for them, right? And, and for me, what, what is important here is, is, is that very often we, um, uh, there's, there's a tendency to assume that, that once you have a, a, an instrument like human rights, that, that it, it has a, a specific manifestation uh, and it has to be evoked in that specific way. Um, whereas if we open our eyes and we don't do that often enough, we will see that, that you know, even global concepts like rights um, are, are grounded in, in very local realities and then have meaning and utility from those realities. And I think the, the more we see that, the less we are, I think, impressed, I suppose, by, by what goes on in, in these global spaces. And actually, if I may add something to that, in some ways, there's a bit of hypocrisy going on because there are lots of rights. So, for instance, there's a huge literature around um, land rights being communal uh, or property rights being quite communal within African traditions. But I don't see a lot of people in the global north see, saying, well, there is this huge tradition. Let's take it to the global north and make intellectual pride, property rights communal. And so there is a selectiveness to the things that we think we need to kind of highlight as being traditional. And I think that that, for me, is actually the problem, is that we are taking these instances that really help us to other communities and saying this is what indigenous means. And I think that this is deeply problematic. No, I agree completely with you because from my own sense, you know, when, when I sit my, with some of my high income country colleagues, uh, the framing of the indigenous is always in terms of traditional medicine, not as say I pointed out a little while ago, that these are the heroic implementers, uh, the adapters of global health policies at regional and national level. So they're invisible. The people who implement are treated as invisible, incapable, who are basically following orders and therefore unimportant. Even the names aren't often mentioned. One of my uh, I get very angry when a polio worker in Afghanistan or Pakistan gets killed. They don't even often mention the name. You know, even in their death, they remain unnamed. They have no rights, no humanity, even uh, at a moment of great sorrow. So the point you make is very, very important for me and very, very well taken. I think there are a lot of questions. So, and uh, we have only about 14 minutes left. So maybe we, I, I should now withdraw and let Madhu come in and uh, uh, make sure the Q&A uh, session goes well, Madhu. Would you like to do that now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Say and Sharifa. Thank you, Say, Sharifa and Sanjoy. It has been a most interesting discussion. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience to share their questions in the Q&A box. And if you don't mind, I would like to start with a question myself. Um, so we've had some very interesting talks as a part of Contagion and Adia Benton, one of our speakers spoke uh, about the sort of militarization of health systems. And that is something that has been, really, it's something we see in many spaces. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, what is the impact 
of that or whether that in itself has an impact upon human rights and the way human rights in health systems are affected. Um, I, I don't know who would like to <laughs> take that question. Is the health systems uh, expert, so he can go first. <laughs> Yeah, um, so, so there's, there's a lot of debate and discussion about securitizing or militarizing global health or health security. And, and, and there are many compelling arguments for, for why it makes sense. But I think what is most important for me is whose, whose interest is militarizing, protecting, right? So, so that, that is always the key question to ask. So, so there's a lot of ex interesting experience in the um, in the Ebola um, outbreak uh, scenario in in Liberia and Sierra Leone in 2014-2016, where um, militaries were there to protect the interests of powerful governments, whether it was um, the U.S. government or the Chinese government or the um, government of Liberia itself, right? And what then often happened was that uh, the U.S. Army was there to protect US interests, Chinese was there to protect Chinese interests, and the army of Liberia itself was there to protect the interest of the government. And what it generates you know, down the line from, that, from there is, is a certain justifiable suspicion and skepticism from the population, which itself ends up being counterproductive as, as, as we've learned from COVID-19 um, as much as we did from Ebola. So, so the question really is in whose, in whose name, in whose interest? Um, th that, that for me is the key question. If you can demonstrate to me that they are truly protecting the interests of the people, mm -hmm. th then we can have a discussion. But, but, but that's so rare for me to even want to begin that discussion in the first place. Yeah, I totally agree with this. I've been doing some work on digital health surveillance, which has become a huge thing with contact tracing apps and kind of all sorts of other apps that have become embedded with the current COVID-19 crisis. And for me, there's kind of a larger question of just even the links between governments and corporations having huge amounts of data from populations with very little scrutiny. And it just seems to me again here that we've had another transfer of power from people to governments and then to corporations with very, very little scrutiny. And I think that that's what worries me with kind of the securitization discourse is that when you look behind it, who's interested in securitization, it's usually large corporations who kind of uh, are thinking about deploying these tools, testing these tools, uh, corporations who are thinking about getting access to samples for vaccines from large population types that they would be unable to test on otherwise. And I think that this should worry us because this is not benign. And I think going back to kind of uh, historians other uh, uh, work on the history of this is that we are not optimistic, <laughs> like seeing what has happened before is we're really not optimistic. And I think that we need to push governments really much, much more on this discourse of securitization. Anjoy, anything to add or shall I ask the next question? No, I mean, I, I completely agree that I think what this pandemic has taught us is that there is a lot of benign sounding waffle all around us. And thinking critically about the concepts being used and pushing back is not just an academic exercise anymore. This is an individual's human right issue. And I would urge all listeners to, to problematize a lot of this sort of terminology that seems to be presented to us for us to swallow, never to question. And it makes me deeply uncomfortable as it, as it does uh, say and Sharif as well, as I can see. So that's all I'd like to say. Okay, uh, the next question we have, which came early on in the talk, is by, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Gordie Van Hetrin. Uh, so they ask, one big problem is that even the best critical voices in the discussions around decolonizing global health uh, for their own funding and institutional affiliation often depend upon larger foundations such as the welcome of funds attached to European American universities, which are part of the structures which come under critical scrutiny. So for instance, the Gates debates. How is it 
can be and how can we move beyond that? Can, can I go first for, for this one? Um, yes. I, I'm often very keen to point out that, that, that those of us in, in this global space are in a bubble. Um, we're in a bubble in which we hear ourselves. You know, we you sort of, what each person says bounces back. And so it's, it's uh, uh, I'm looking for a word, I can't find it, but it's, it's, over, it's overemphasized essentially. Um, and what, what that does to us, because attention is very often zero sum. Once you're focused on something, you don't see other things. Um, is that, that this, these conversations are happening in, in other spaces too, right? Um, so when I talk to my friends in, in Nigeria, when I talk to my colleagues in Australia, uh, when I talk to my Indian friends, I know they're having these conversations. Now, because we, meaning globalized people, are, are not in those spaces, we're, we're not hearing them. Um, and so, so there's this skew in our perception of who is talking about decolonization. Um, that, that me, far many, many, many more people <laughs> than are funded by the Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust are talking about these issues. I, I think that's the first thing to bear in mind, that, to not forget that, that, that this is the, the conversation that, that that question is reckoning with. It's, it's a very small part of the larger conversation. Now, the, the other question to then ask is, is why is it that, that we are not seeing those conversations? Right? And, and that is on us. Like it's, it's not on them, it, it's on us that, that we are not seeing what is going on in other places. Uh, and we need to, to build an, an infrastructure for knowledge that allows us to see things and for, that allows knowledge to flow more seamlessly. Because for me, it's a question of barriers, that, that we need to break those barriers for, for these contestations, for, for this um, disquiet to be heard more broadly. Yeah. yeah, and I guess maybe if I may add on to that, and I think that it's also, I think, a really good thing that we have more people speaking truth to power within these organizations. And I think that that is a mark of progress. That if you think about uh, a lot of these institutions were the same. And so you're getting these voices that are creating disruptions, which I think is good because it then means that there are challenges on these organizations around their status quo, which I think is a good thing. It's not happening fast enough. But I think that it's a good thing. It's a good thing that Sanjoy can disrupt the WHO's history through and kind of, uh, and people will, will take it seriously because it's kind of like a huge disruptor of this single narrative. And I think uh, that that I think is worth considering. I think for me, the other challenge that I think has been important is kind of what the concept of academic freedom means. Mm -hmm. And, and fighting for that concept uh, as somebody who is in this space, I think that that has been quite important to kind of reflect on what that means and fighting for kind of that sense of this, we, we really need to fight for this concept that this should mean something. Thank you, uh, Sai and Sharifa. Um, I'll also ask the next question, uh, which is from Fane. Uh, so he asks, the rights are, articulated, rights are articulated at the scale of nation states, but must be negotiated often on a daily basis at the local scale of a city or at a village. So does this split set up a crisis of recognition at local scales? Should we not incorporate the right to the city and the right to the village as key foundations in the discourse on rights? Um, the localization. I think that this is a fantastic question. And in some ways is the inherent tension in rights. So on one hand, you want to have some sort of universality, but on the other hand, you want to kind of have local meanings of rights. But I think that that actually is an important tension because what you do not want is to kind of say, in my village, I accept that you're going to be able to kill somebody and that is fine. We must have things that we think are so absolutely fundamental that everybody should have them. And I think the expansion of these fundamental things in order to be able to speak differently. So I've been trying to really think uh, increasingly about property rights and how we can construct the notion of property rights differently and take on broader perspectives. And I think that that is really important. 
So in some ways, the village level for me is the most important level because that is where we seem to still have these ideas of collectivism. In some ways, most of the cities have already moved to kind of what their colonizers had, which is kind of very individualistic uh, con conceptions of property. And I think that we've lost something from that. And I think as say keeps talking, uh, keeps saying, it's really trying to really connect those spaces again and make sure that we have these conversations that are trying to kind of create these um, uh, rights that are understood both universally, but also in multiple levels, but also to try and understand why some of these, for instance, city rights have changed. That in some ways we kind of say, well, but in this city, so I don't know, Nairobi or whatever, they do this without a clear understanding of why some of the rights in those places have changed. And that is in many cases really largely due to colonial structures that created municipal laws that change some of those spaces in certain ways. And so actually that is not in any way more traditional than in any sense, because it's just a construct. And it's really in understanding it as a construct that I think we can come to a better understanding of what universality means. Say, would you like to add? Yeah. I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about um, an entity broadly defined as community health committees. It has different names in different places. But there, there are these community-based uh, groups that essentially function to co-govern primary healthcare services with whoever is governing it, government, private sector, whoever. Uh, and it, it's always enlightening to, to just to, to listen to them. Um, I did I did a study just reading the minutes of their meetings so for, for about 10 years, just sort of just getting a sense of what how they think, what they talk about. And the implicit nature of, of rights in, in how they construct their narrative, I think it's very important. There, there is a sense in which um, rights are universal in that, that people know that certain things are due to them. They may not always have the language to, to deploy it um, in a way that we would recognize. Uh, and they may not always have the, even the, the knowledge to, to know what exactly it is they need to demand. But, but I've often been, been impressed and surprised and, and excited about the extent to which they, they get things done. And, and for me, it's that connection, um, understanding the different framings of rights, but also understanding what people need at different levels to claim their rights and making sure that you provide those resources for them, whether it's knowledge or whether it's finances. Um, I've, one of the things that I'm most surprised by is, is just the, the fact of the distance, um, the size of a community could play a huge role in how effective these communities could be in demanding their rights. In smaller communities where they just walk to the local council office, it's far easier to make demands. In places where they have to plan for several months to send someone on a bike to travel to you know, the local government council uh, headquarters somewhere else is often difficult. So ju just the simple understanding of how rights get plays out in, in local communities, I think is very important. The, the second point that, that I wanted to make is also this idea. Now, there was an interesting discussion a, a few months ago about uh, uh, the World Bank had funded a, a study in Kenya, I think, a, a trial to, to disconnect people's uh, water supply to check whether that would make them want to pay for it. Um, which once you think about it, you see how evil it sounds. It is really evil. Now, when people complained about that study, one of the arguments in defense of it was that, but it was the government's policy. The government was doing it anyway. We were just sort of randomizing within the space of a government policy. And it goes back to the, to the issue Sheriff I mentioned earlier that, that you know, that, that you, you, can't, you can't just say we, we kill people here, so that's fine. Like, we can't just say we, we disconnect people's access to water here, so that's fine. So we World Bank, you can do anything you want. So, so there has to be a certain point at which you say some things are basic and essential and fundamental. Uh, and, and even if the government was doing it, the World Bank should not, and, and any researcher should not feel themselves in a position to, to, to validate it or reinforce it or generate evidence to support it. So, so again, as an example of how people can conflict these ideas that, that it's, it's legal, so, so it's ethical. Right? Wow, that, that was something. 
uh, I think we are also coming to the end of our time, and I think before we, uh, before I say our thank yous and close the session, I I just like to do one last question of sorts. We we in today's discussion we've had many interesting questions, right? Starting from what is vulnerable, what do we consider as human rights? I was wondering if I could ask each of you to leave, uh, especially for the young audiences who will be listening to this, who will be inspired by this discussion. I'd, I'd like to ask if you could each leave us with one critical question you think they should be thinking about after today's discussion. Just one question from each of you to, you know, uh, incite them to be, uh, to take home from here. If I might ask uh, everyone. <laughs> well, I guess my question is, what does it mean to be human? And I think this actually is a serious question. It's now becoming a serious question. The ways in which our interactions are do uh, uh, our interactions are changing very quickly. And I think we're going to really have to reckon with that in the next five to 10 years. So this whole idea about AI coming to save us, it can also do us enormous harm. It can also really heighten inequalities. And I think if you're young now, you should really be very interested in what it means to be human and center that in kind of your interactions with the world because very soon there's going to be something that does everything better than you were and being human has to count for something. Thank you, uh, Sharifa. Say. Yeah, so um, hard, hard question to answer, but, but here's, here's what I'll suggest. That, that whenever a question of rights come up, always ask who is responsible. Um, rights come with rights bearers and, and people who are responsible for, for protecting them. So every time you mention rights, ask yourself who is responsible and who, whom should I hold to account for this? I think it's very important. And that's a really good guiding principle. Sandra, if I could ask you for the last question. Yeah, so, you know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about as a father to two young daughters uh, is, is it enough to vaccinate a community against COVID when that community is fearful of dying from many other diseases of poverty as well? So I want to challenge the young listeners today into reconsidering the idea of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, uh, you know, it's a stigmatiz stigmatizing term often that overgeneralizes the local problem. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, uh, if someone is saying, what's the point in taking the COVID vaccine? I might die of cholera. Is that person an anti-vaxxer or just a realist? You know, these are things we need to think about, I think. Thank you so much, uh, Sai, Sharifa, Sanjoy. That was an extremely hard-hitting uh, session. And I think we've opened up a lot of very interesting points for people to think about. I'd also just like to remind all our audiences who are listening that the recording of this event, as long as the, well, as the recording of all our other events and lectures are on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed this or you want to come back and listen again, especially to these three important questions, do check out our YouTube channel. Uh, if you've enjoyed this discussion today, please also watch Jashri's, P. Jashri's film, which is being screened as a part of the exhibition season. A human question, which looks at access to healthcare. Also, listen to Achal Prabhula's talk, Everything You Want to Know About Non Western COVID Vaccines, which also talks about in inequities and in access and trust on vaccines. Uh, don't miss Sridhar Venkatapuram's COVID video, a short three minute video on health and justice in a pandemic, which explores socioeconomic systems which play a critical role in the spread and control of infectious diseases. Once again, I'd like to thank Sanjoy, Sway, and Sharifa and remind everyone to please share your feedback. It would be great to know what you enjoyed about the session and what we can do better in the future. And on the last note, uh, everyone, please do stay safe, take care. And this is our last weekend. So do continue to tune in for all the programs. And thank you, everyone, for making the time to be here today. It was a lovely discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs>